first chance I've had to say hi to everybody. Uh, my name's Tony Shaw, I'm the founder of Dataversity, and um, along with my colleague Dan McCreary, who's gonna kick off the talks right now, is uh, I'm the co-chair of the conference. So I hope we're off to a good start. I uh, hope you learned something valuable today, and um, that the next couple of days so. are even more valuable for you. The format for this evening is uh, lightning talks. So, um, oh, I wanna give this to you, Barry. Uh, so basically, the format of a lightning talk is five minutes, you know, and uh, it's, a, it's a real hard deadline. So my colleague, Victoria, here is operating our timer. Um, she has a computer that faces the speaker, so the speaker can see, uh, no, not yet. <laughs> um, so the speaker can see this, and you can uh, watch the, the timer countdown as well. Uh, for the benefit of the speakers, when that hits one minute, color changes to yellow, when it hits zero, Victoria will chime the conclusion of your talk. She's gonna come up with a tune. <laughs> so um, the, the whole point really is that in the space of about 45 minutes, we're gonna go through eight different presentations and hopefully get eight great ideas. We're gonna come out with three or four, that's not bad either. Um, the, uh, the names of the sessions are all in the guidebook app, which is that electronic, uh, that mobile app that if you've downloaded that, you'll be able to see them. But um, briefly, I'm gonna tell you. So we're gonna kick off with, with Dan on the topic of NoSQL and agility. Then Steve Brodsky of IBM is gonna talk about uh, new tools for Hadoop and big data. Neil Raiden's gonna give a, a presentation on in-memory databases, the pros and cons of those. Uh, Jans Osman of France is gonna talk about the power of linked data. And then we're gonna to transition to Barry Morris, uh, who just got a patent the other day. I'm not sure if he's gonna tell us about the patent exactly, but um, gonna talk about when SQL meets NoSQL. By the way, with, I heard a lot of no, no SQL today. I've, is there consensus? What, is, what does and it mean? And I'm giving feedback somewhere if that's controllable. Thanks. Hands up, no SQL. Have you heard of it? Hands up, no SQL. Oh. <laughs> preference, no preference. Okay. Um, Jeff Malavsky of Phasic. Jeff, where are you? Over on the right here, gonna talk about uh, corporate no SQL enabling agile data governance. Um, Mike Hummel of Parstream, Past, uh, just in from Germany. Welcome, Mike. Gonna talk about real-time big data analytics and indexed column stores. And then uh, Vlad Bakvinsky is gonna uh, wrap us up with the seven habits of successful NoSQL adoptions. So um, let me move up here. There's, there's something really tinny coming out of there, isn't it? Or am I the only one who can hear it? I think, okay. yeah, I can hear it. So is there any echo in this one? I guess they're okay. Yours sounds better than mine. Maybe I'm standing too far forward. Yeah, it could be that you're ca catching some speakers. Does this make any difference when I stand back here? Okay, lesson learned. All right, Dan, your remote is I'm ready. there. Victoria, you're ready to start? Okay, um, then let's get going. Dan McCreary. Okay, now the, one of the things about these lightning sessions is audience participation. So if you like anything, you're always welcome to, welcome to clap. If you don't, uh, you know, booze are acceptable. Uh, so I want to talk about NoSQL and agility. And I, I want to start out by saying I'm really mad. You know, Tony and I, when we started this conference, we said, should we call it big data or should we call it NoSQL? Because both of them are big themes. And if you look at the Google Trends, you see that big data is getting this huge spike. And NoSQL is still growing, but maybe not quite so fast. I'm really mad at big data. Big data has started to take the limelight and been pushing a lot of the other reasons why we're going to NoSQL out of the way. It's just one use case, for heaven's sakes. So big data has become the big bully. Isn't that true? You go to these things and there's all these wonderful things we can do about high availability and other things. Big data has pushed everything else out of the way. What we really need is to have a fair and balanced approach. I'd like to talk to you about one of my favorite reasons to be joining NoSQL is agility. Agility is smart, agility is quick, 
Agility gets you out of trouble if your project's behind schedule. Agility opens new doors and new business opportunities that you didn't know you had until you started to move to new NoSQL systems. The most important thing about NoSQL is that instead of one big massive relational database, just like the old shortwave radio receiver where you had all these knobs and you could tune in these remote stations, we can tune in the right service levels. Isn't that what agility is about? As if the web volume goes up, we can tune in things. Agility means that we can quickly change the systems that we build based on the changing business requirements. And it's not just the changing demands in volume, it's also the changing reliability requirements that we have. The web service that we thought was going to be a really nice pilot, now everybody depends on. We want to be able to check that little box that says, also make this run in multiple data centers. That's the reason that we're using NoSQL for agility. Do you remember this old floor translation model that we had when we had these web pages? We had to translate them into objects. We had to take those objects, move them into the relational database, get them out of the database, back into this translation into objects and things. Isn't that kind of like driving in the mud? Isn't that this quagmire of all these things that if you change any of these, you have to change them all together? There's no other systems I know that help you be more agile when you remove all this translation. When you say, everything in my browser is going to be exactly the same structures that's in my database. And that allows you to change your requirements quickly and also to empower other people that are not Java programmers to be able to do those things. For us, the people that I work with, uh, allowing NoSQL to do direct document to document is the best way to increase the ability to add new things, to engage other people without that big middle tier, to get rid of all the shredding and object relational, no assembly uh, required, you just make it resilient to change. Adding new features just by changing the document structure and you're done. So agility is really what I think people should be uh, thinking about and one of the things we're starting to see now is that this, uh, this chart shows how uh, object relational frameworks like Hibernate is the uh, blue one on top is going down as the amount of traffic in NoSQL is going up. Uh, frameworks like um, Ruby on Rails starting to flatten out. The more that we can use NoSQL, the more that we can uh, get rid of the middle tier, get rid of the complexity, and make our systems easier to respond to business cha changing business requirements. So agility also has a lot of other friends that come with the NoSQL world. Simplicity, where we're using simple key value stores that can be portable around. Testability, because we have a lot fewer interfaces to test. Performance, quality, and empowerment. You can come to the NoSQL party for big data, but we want you to stay for agility. Nicely done, Dan. Tell you what, I'll uh, I'll give Steve this one. So uh, Steve Brodsky from IBM is going to talk to us about new tools for Hadoop and big data. Steve? Hi. Thanks very much. I'm Steve Brodsky. What I'm going to do is show you one chart, and then I'm going to show you a demo. And the basic idea is we've got all this capability in big data. A lot of it's open source. That's great. Mostly the open source is about runtime. What happens if you put together the open source, and you put together analytics on the open source, and then you put together tools that bring together the people that are going to use the open source and the data together. And so you think about that. What can we do quickly in a scenario? What we're going to do is we're going to crawl the web, pull down financial statements in their original text in actual HTML forms. This is going to be IBM's financial statements for the last 10 years by quarter. We're then going to uh, graph it, and we're going to make it uh, reusable so that we can build apps. This is sort of like the iPad, Apple-style apps, or Android-style apps, depending on your perspective. 
and uh, make it so that you can do things like issue Hive queries and see the results. And so the idea is that we're bringing the people together as well as the data uh, through analysis. So let's see if we can show the video. And I will narrate as it goes, assuming that it shows. Yes, great. So we have as a web console as the main tool that allows people to easily see what's going on in their cluster. We're gonna just go tab by tab as we go through the scenario. First, let's make sure our cluster is up. So what you're seeing on the left is all the major different kinds of servers. We have a lot of the popular open source in there, the state of every cluster, MapReduce, Hadoop, uh, HDFS, Hive, Flume, Zookeeper, HBase, Uzi, a lot of the common uh, powerful things that people find in NoSQL, and of course we're always adding more. What you're seeing then is it's easy to add nodes to the cluster, check if things are up or down, start them or stop them. Now that we've done that administrative thing to make sure our cluster is up, everything's ready to go, it's time to go in and uh, look at our files. What you see here is, is a browser for HDFS, the file system, lets you look at any particular files, and it's easy to browse. People are used to this uh, explorer-style concept. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna switch into app-style concepts and do that web crawling. So the first thing you notice is there's a, a palette of apps that you can choose. Each app does something uh, useful, import, export from databases. In this particular case, we're gonna switch uh, and look at one that looks like it's gonna execute a Hive query. Over here, we're looking at one that's gonna do some uh, database import, export, distributed file copy. It's very easy to build much more sophisticated apps as well, and you can also wrap existing code as apps, so it makes it easy for a lot of different users to leverage. You can kind of think of the left side as your app store. Now, we're gonna first crawl the web, so we have a web crawler app that's gonna be pointed to the IBM uh, financial website. Since it's a lightning talk, then we've crawled that web. It was built by wrapping the Nutch open source web crawler as an app. Now what you see is what we call big sheets, is the ability to take a common spreadsheet style or Excel style concept of what's inside of your cluster, but view it as a spreadsheet. What we've done is we've looked at the results of those spreadsheets, we've picked up uh, the URLs which showed where we crawled from, looked at the original HTML that went up and down really quickly to show that was the original web page we've crawled. We now have this raw HTML, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at some of the sheets of how we can analyze it. With this particular sheet, what you might notice is year, uh, quarter, uh, billions of dollars in sales. These are, are some of the breakdowns we've done by taking that raw HTML and creating another spreadsheet that's based on it, which represents a view of the actual structured information we've extracted. And we've done this with um, much more complicated documents as well. You can then, of course, do many common things you'd expect out of a spreadsheet-style tool, such as, as graph your financial results by quarter. The ability to do things like um, use social media, get 360 degree view of your customer, et cetera, is also possible using the same text analytics capability. Then what we did is we said, okay, great, let's make an app which is going to go and run Hive SQL against this structured financial information. We have uh, up at the top uh, what the select statement actually looks like. You can fill in a bunch of parameters. It's an XML-driven uh, form-based input. You can schedule, you can uh, update other sheets. You can see at the bottom half all the existing runs. You can make this uh, application run quickly. Uh, we will be uh, releasing a, a more significant version which has dashboards and application chaining workflow all coming up uh, very quickly. So what you see anyways as we're at the end of this demo is we have um, wrote a new app, made it analyze our financial results. Thank you. Well, since this is a, uh, a NoSQL conference, I decided to go no slides. Um, but because of that, I have no idea whether I have five minutes or 20 minutes or three minutes. Um, I have some jokes in case I run short, though, so it'll be all right. Um, and this is difficult for me because, as Tony knows, I always come to these conferences exquisitely prepared. 
with uh, polished slides, and I've rehearsed them. You see, Tony is laughing. Um, uh, in memory databases, you know, I think it's, it's inevitable that someday everything will be in memory. Um, and whether it's silicon based, you know, dynamic RAM chips or something else, who knows. Uh, but it is kind of ridiculous to store lots of data on devices that are 1,000 or 10,000 times slower when you have something else. It's just a matter of cost, but the market should take care of that. But in the meantime, um, we have a, a, a tiered memory arrangement, and we see that there are a lot of uh, uh, in-memory databases starting to appear. It's not new. There have been in-memory databases for a long, long time. In fact, in my research, I've counted over 30 of them. But of course, the big daddy right now is SAP's HANA. That's the one that's getting all the attention. So I'll probably, in, in my examples, talk more about that than, than anything else. Um, one thing to keep in mind, it, wow, it's going fast, I better go faster. Um, all, all CPUs more or less operate the same. Well, all standard CPUs, obviously there's specialized things, but a CPU gets a piece of information from memory, it gets an instruction, and it operates on it, and it doesn't have any idea if it's working with a database or if it's working with some other kind of application program or, or, or pushing up a web page. So the real trick in any kind of software is how you orchestrate those little bitty pieces of instructions, how they happen, and that's where you get efficiency. So whether something is in memory or not doesn't really matter, uh, because if it's not in memory, it has to get there before the CPU can operate on it, correct? So what that really means is that um, in-memory databases can't just take existing software and port them to run in memory and they'll run faster. In fact, I've actually seen cases, you know how things can be I.O. bound. If you get a terabyte of memory and you're starting to slam stuff through it, you actually get something that's CPU bound. The CPU gets flooded with data and it bogs down. So it really takes a lot of effort to make something work. The other thing to think about is, in, is compression. I know Hana talks about 10 times compression. That's actually a myth. Um, it's more like three and a half times because the first thing they have to do is load everything else in that terabyte of memory, not just the data, okay? Um, and now I'm really going fast. I thought I had uh, less than five minutes of information. Um, the other thing is in-memory databases aren't really in memory. They're only partially in memory. They have to stage things on disks to be persistent. And we're seeing, especially when you're looking at high levels of compression, columnar, in-memory, and so forth, that the amount of data out on traditional disk, whether it's SSD or, or platters, uh, can be as much as 10 times the amount of data inside the database. Now let's talk about total capacity. With HANA, you can put a terabyte of memory. You can now expand up to 16 nodes, 16 terabytes of memory times three and a half. That's about the equivalent of 50 terabytes. <laughs> That's nothing, right? You can't, you can't even run a data warehouse with 50 terabytes of data anymore. So the idea that you can build an in-memory database that handles analytics and OLTP in the same mechanism is crazy because none of them are ACID compliant. They say they are, but they're sort of lazy ACID compliant. What it means is, you know, we can get it into memory that fast, but then we have to sit around and wait for it to update on the persistent disk that may be mirrored and all sorts of things, right? So that doesn't work either. Um, and the cost is tremendous. It may be a lot less than it used to be, but you know, like Steely Dan said, it's cheap, but it's not free. Uh, when you start looking at 16 terabytes of memory, you're looking at millions of dollars. So it's not like putting up a, a database and saying, boy, this is going to be great. It's going to be really fast. And one last thing you may not have thought about, and that is it takes a hell of a lot of power to keep 16 terabytes of dynamic RAM running 24-7. In fact, it takes more power than it does to take an equivalent hybrid storage where we have hot, warm, and cold storage based on how we do it. Um, so if you're looking for green, this may not be the best place to go. Now, look, obviously, you know, when it comes to, when it comes to relational databases, we know they've got a lot of uh, uh, drawbacks uh, in terms of being rigid and so forth. But in-memory database is an emerging thing. And it, as far as I'm concerned, today, it's not really ready for prime time except in some fairly small niche areas. Um, so I'm expecting a lot of grief about this later on, and I'm ready for it. So. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs>
a bit of background here. Um, how many folks here have dabbled with uh, semantic technology, IBS, database, database, etc.? Oh, more than you could. <laughs> um, I first met Jans and uh, his colleague Craig and folks at Franz uh, Bureau of Hexes just over in Oakland a few weeks ago uh, when I was also organizing a related field, a uh, related conference in the semantic technology field. So I'm just keen to hear what you are going to tell us tonight about linked data. Thanks, Jan. Yeah, okay. So Tony asked me to uh, talk a little bit about the power of linked data and to give a demo of our graph database. So um, who knows about linked open data? Only a few, oh man. So basically what you do is you take all the knowledge in the world and you connect it in one big graph and you have a mechanism to query it. Facebook, Bing, Google are now building up big proprietary uh, knowledge graphs where they take all the people they find, the places, the organizations, and everything else, and they link it together so that they can create better search engines and can answer questions better. But the semantic community already started about 10 years ago. Tim Berners-Lee had this big dream that we would take the entire web, add metadata to it in a standard way. We take every object, give it a name as a URL, make it differentiable by putting HTTP in front, putting interesting information around a particular object, and then link it to other objects. Yeah? And so um, this principle is now being used in the enterprise and the government, the data.gov, is now working with uh, RPI to take all the government data and put it also in RDF and in triples. And about 2007, who knows this picture, by the way? Only a small group, okay. 2007, we already had about 40, 50 of these big files somewhere on the web um, that contained data in the form of RDF or triples. So for example, the DBpedia is about 300 million triples that describe the Wikipedia. GeoName, seven million places on Earth described as triples in RDF. This is 2010, yeah, so now we have pharma data, government data, multimedia media data, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm doing a quick demo where I take five databases that I downloaded from the web, one with side effects, one with drugs, uh, one with clinical trials, the database with medicine and with uh, diseases, and they all link together through the URLs. For example, you take Drug Bank as a website, but you can just go to Google and say download RDF drug bank and you get the triple version. And let me just show you how that works. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so I have all these databases downloaded and I can look for something like ibuprofen and cancer. I get a bunch of triples back that contain these t both these two words. I can change, take, um, oh. I can show, say, three clinical trials to talk about them. Um, so here you see what some information, you see this clinical trial uh, discusses these diseases, these drugs, these side effects. I can click on something like aspirin, and I see triples about aspirin. So I'm jumping from one database to the other. Um, I see, well, the chemical formula, the mechanism of action. I can look at other clinical trials to discuss that, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, so I can go from one step to the other. I can explore the graph by basically saying which predicates I want to follow. So I can say, give me the diseases, drugs, and side effects and targets, both coming in and going out. And I can um, show a few values. So now you see the graph. And I can take any other topic. So say, let's something like a romantic kissing, which has proven to reduce your blood pressure. Yeah. So we have this particular clinical trial and how would this thing link to something with ibuprofen? So you let the graph database do its work. It finds 12,000 paths between the two. So I can do something like this. We diffuse shortest path, and now I get a much bigger graph. And then there's a query language called Sparkle. Anyone heard of Sparkle? Oh, good, that's good. Yeah, so this is a, a query that actually looks at five different databases. Three different databases. Give me a drug with the name Lipitor, a side effect di diabetes, and then give me every trial that talks both about this drug and the side effect. And then you get the results, and here's the official graph of this. Yeah. So this is the shortest demo ever of uh, semantic technology. Quickly, back to my presentation. Uh, where was I? About here. So anyway, um, on Wednesday, I'm going to talk... 
about when you want to use a graph database and when you want to use a NoSQL database. Um, and on Wednesday, I also talk about some use cases where we actually loaded up to a trillion triples, yeah, and did some very, very interesting work with that. And we actually take our um, triple store and we also completely integrate it with Solar and Mongo. And come to our booth if you want to see how that works. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. And Thanks, I had a great Jan. joke here, but you don't want to see it. Well, we have, we have about 10 seconds worth of transition time here, oh. if you have a joke. Oh, sorry. Okay, I'm going to wire up Barry while Jans tells a joke. No, I just want to say about the DA dropped the case because they didn't have 40 terabytes of storage. Yeah. So and this, this is a conference about big data. Somebody want to tell me where the slideshow view? Oh, well, it's you gave me a PDF. Yeah, that's okay. It should be. It should so, be. it should be okay. I can maximize the screen for you. All right. That's all right. about all I can I'll do. I probably need to use this directly. Okay, okay fine. We'll just go. That's okay. You want me to? Ah, thank you. Okay, this should come off your time, but we're going to cut you some slack. All right. Yeah, okay. Since I couldn't figure it out either. Okay. <laughs> I'm not sure that the clicker is going to work, but we'll try it, and if not... All right, okay. well, if not, then I'll do it for you. No, it's okay. I, I, I can handle it, no problem. All right. All right, let's go. So uh, my name is Barry Morris, CEO of NeuroDB. I'm here to talk about when SQL meets NoSQL. And uh, I do realize that uh, that might be a controversial topic here. We, we're all aware that there's a, a problem with traditional databases um, in the context of modern data centers and modern workloads. Um, you've got your own ways of describing it, but it's data center problems, it's workload problems, it's developer productivity problems, and so on. Um, the, the difficulty is that, and by the way, the people in this room, the community in this room have done a great job of solving those kinds of problems in a different way. These are scalability and flexibility and simplicity kinds of problems. The difficulty is that there are a bunch of things that are not solved um, by this, and uh, there are the things that traditional databases have done very well for 30 years. And there are things about powerful set-based query languages and reliable data and transactions and, and integration with enterprise ecosystems and stuff like that. And we've kind of said to customers, you know what, you've got to choose. You can pick the scalability, flexibility, simplicity stuff, or you can pick the powerful, reliable enterprise uh, ecosystem stuff. And most customers I talk to say, do I really have to choose? Wouldn't it be nice if I could have all of the above? So that's the question we're here to talk about. Let me introduce Jim. I won't spend a lot of time on him. Um, he's one of the top database scientists in the world. He spent 30 years building database systems. Back to DEC and uh, RDB, Interbase. He invented Blobs. He invented MVCC. Um, Jim was one of the top architects of MySQL when he went at this question. He said, why is it that databases don't scale out? Why is it that traditional databases have to scale up? And, um, and he came out with the answer that SQL is scalable inherently, or not, not, is, is inherently not, not scalable. Uh, ditto for transactions. The problem is the design of the databases. We've built databases the same way for 30 years. Is there a new way of building databases that, in fact, solves this problem? He started in a completely different place, brought in a whole lot of new ideas about distributed systems, and came up with this thing. What is an emergent system? You're probably aware of it. Um, think of a flock of birds. A flock of birds takes off at the same time, lands at the same time, flies south at the same time, and yet no one's in control. It's a completely peer-to-peer -peer system, and in fact, that's the only way that nature puts big systems together. It's how antelope migrate, it's how ants build communities, it's how crystals grow, and so on. And this is the opposite of how people build databases. 
Databases are, are typically monolithic, centralized, synch synchronous, and so on. We're talking about a database system that's asynchronous, peer-to-peer, -peer, loosely coupled, um, and exactly the opposite of what you're used to. Um, so I'm not going to have time to talk you through this, uh, the solution. I always get the question, what is it? How does it work? Um, you'll see that there's some ideas in there that are actually no SQL ideas. For example, the storage in the back end is simply key value stores. By the way, give me whatever key, key value store you want. We'll use it quite happily. I don't have time to talk through how this all works, but the magic source in all of this is this, this emergent architecture, this peer-to-peer this, uh, this, uh, -peer system. So what we have, and um, you're going to have to take my word for it. I don't have the ability, like Jan's, to uh, give you a demo right now. But um, what we have is something that gives you all of the above. Anything you can do in your, in your NoSQL system, we can do. Anything you can do in your SQL system, we can do. Uh, problem is solved. May not be what you want, but the problem is solved. We have all of the SQL power of SQL, the reliability of ASTER, the integration with enterprise in, you know, ecosystems, uh, but we also have the scalability, reliability, and simplicity, and particularly the developer friendliness that you're used to. Um, got a bit of time to talk about this. The scalability, by, the, by scalability, what I mean is elasticity. I mean, you can walk up to the console, that's the console that you're looking at there, and you simply say, take this machine, add it to a running database. Immediately, your transactions per second go through the roof, okay? You can keep doing that. This thing, we, we're scaling at, at the moment on hundreds of cores. Easy to do. You can take them away again. As long as one of these uh, machines is running in each tier, you've still got a reliable database, okay? Because it's a peer-to-peer -peer system. There's nothing on that diagram that is a single point of failure. Nowhere. You can take out, it's like a flock of birds. You have to take out the whole flock if you wanted to stop, stop flying. Um, and uh, on simplicity, well, all of your tools work. It's a SQL database. So you can use all the stuff that you're using, all the applications you're using, all the skills that you're using, and, and always have. That's uh, pretty much all I've got to say. Um, do come and have a look at it at our website if you have an interest. All right. Uh, Jeff, if you could make your way up, please. I'll bring it. So, um, Barry, can we assume that the patent that you got is in that quote unquote secret thing that you didn't um, tell us about? The, we, we actually have disclosed everything that there is to know about how this works in a very legalistic patent, if you're good at reading legalistic patents. We announced that two weeks ago. Uh, we got it in less than a year because there's no prior art on doing this kind of stuff. And in fact, there were no office actions, which means pushback on the patent at all. One microphone short up here, so struggling through that. But uh, anyway, my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Jeff Malavsky. Jeff? Hi, uh, thank you. I'm uh, going to go into New Yorker mode, so that's plenty of time. I'm going to give you a 90-minute brief in five minutes, which I've actually done in my life. So what we're about, we're going to do a little bit. Actually, I'm going to save a lot of my time because I'm going to do an object-oriented brief because a lot of my preface uh, Dan McCreary did, so I am extending the Dan McCreary talk. So I'm just going to jump over all that. But we are focused on the corporate structured data environment. And we're going to dive down into something called data semantics. So everyone talked about that. But what you cannot do in the real world is excise the human from the loop. And so everyone in here, like I'm a technical guy, I have a PhD in chemistry. It's great to talk technology. That is not the solution space in a real corporate environment. So everyone's talking data center consolidation, not happening. We talk to major CIOs. The only thing that's happening in data center consolidation right now is two things. Outsource to somebody or pick up the servers, rent a U-Haul, and drive them to the other side of the town and claim success. Uh, there's actually no real consolidation occurring. So uh, what we're going to do is drive through this first credibility slide. Uh, have we done this? Yeah, we did this. We did this with all the HR data in the Navy. I've given this talk before, but that's the biggest one, and it was also the hardest one. I have an open bet with a lot of people. Steak dinner for your family for a year if you can ever find data that is worse than the Navy human resources data and has spent more of your tax money attempting to and failing to fix it. 
Uh, but to drive into data semantics, because a lot of people talk about abstractions, and I'm going to uh, disagree with a lot of people in the semantics world, because I'm looking at the last mile. How do you really get the person who wants to merge the data from various sources into a meaningful uh, repository? And here is one place that it uh, differs, even from the NoSQL world, and even like the purveyors like Yahoo and Google and people like that. There's a huge difference if you are, can accept stochastic results, which are all web-based search engines. It's okay to get near the result. That's good enough or a deterministic result, which is what you need in an infrastructure, intranet, or mission critical system, where I gotta get right to the right answer at the right time, and I need an awareness to know if I'm missing it or I'm hitting it. That's a different environment. So here are some open source um, examples that we got from a university about semantic conflicts. And these are three of five systems about uh, regular real estate data. I like it because you would think that real estate data is kind of trivial. But here, look at the, the uh, three columns and three tables about garage spaces. Something as simple as that. So all, on the one on the left, it's clearly not looking like the one on the right. So how are you going to build the canonical data model? How are you going to decide what the semantic intent is? How are you going to build your conceptual, logical, physical model? And the answer is it doesn't get done because the meaning of the data is not being captured by business process modeling. It is not being captured by enterprise architecture. It is not being captured by all the requirements being done everywhere. So who has to solve this problem? The guy doing ETL who never reads any policy anywhere, anytime, all right? But now even we ignore that left one, look at the right one, and we can go, okay, well that's relatively simple, they're both integers. Must be simple to merge it. No, because there could be different legal definitions of what constitutes a garage space by each state. Do we know that answer? No. So to investigate, to even merge that data is a problem. And then you want to go over that. That's data semantics. That is the single biggest hurdle on all merging of data warehouses, corporate and government today. I personally know in the government sphere of about $10 billion that has been spent on this that have produced zero. And whatever your politics are, that came out of your pocket. So what we have is we have corporate NoSQL, which goes into existing database servers in existing hardware. Like all NoSQL, it increases performance by at least a factor of 10 to the fourth. And then I'm running out of time, so what is corporate NoSQL? Because of the reality of having to mesh with existing organizations, existing people, existing data engineers, it simply blends the best of both types, which is this, and this was really done for all that HR. It has tables, that's what people like, so you can have data concepts organized, but look at each table. Some primary keys and a type value pair. What goes into the type element is vocabulary, which we define and manage. That model and the vocabulary was done in real time with business people and put in production Oracle data servers. And I'm going to talk slowly for four seconds. And here's some stuff you can read because it's not on my time. All right, Jeff, well done. Thank you. And you can, of course, follow up with Jeff. Uh, he has a booth out on the floor this week. All right. So um, I asked Mike to speak just uh, maybe 24 hours ago. <laughs> um, and uh, so it was, it was just uh, sort of a fortuitous event that he's with us today. But um, I'm delighted that you're here, Mike. So take it away. Okay, uh, thanks. Yes, that'll That's advance fun. your slides. Uh, so thank you very much for inviting me. And it was actually truly 24 hours ago that I reached out to him uh, because we just closed our first financing round in the US and relocated the company to the US. Uh, we actually closed it with Koshla and that's a major step for us. Um, it's all about real-time big data analytics and we actually started four years ago. And we did it because we had a real problem that was in the tourism space, and Germans like to travel, but they much more like to search for the right travel offers. Billions of offers, thousands of queries per second, and less than a second response time with a multidimensional filter and a group on millions of data records. That's what we started with. And what did we build? We actually built a database from scratch in C++, which is a columnar database with standard interfaces, but with 
specialized index structures on it. And the index structures are bitmap indices, highly compressed, and we can analyze them in their compressed format. There is no need for decompression. And we can do that massively parallel. So it's an MPP distributed shared nothing system, which works with bitmap indices, and it's highly specialized on analyzing data. It's not supporting transactions, and therefore you can take that shortcut. How did we build it? If you look at a column in our database and you equip it with a bitmap index, you can do many operations just by doing X, or and end operations for the multidimensional filtering. And on the bitmap indices, you can also do a lot of mathematics, like sums, min, maxes, averages. You can do all these basic mathematical operations on the index, which is highly compressed, which is much, much smaller than the data you actually have to analyze. And we have a patent on the compression technique, which allows us to analyze the compressed bitmap indices massively parallel. So we use all the cores of a system. And why is this relevant? Because we really achieved multidimensional filtering with extremely high throughput, thousands of queries per second, and with continuous data load. So we load in streams and analyze it together with historical data with sub-second response times even on billions of data records. That's not theory. That's used in production 24 times 7 at some customers in Europe and in Australia. And we have started testing about two months ago with the first clients here in the US. One example is SEO optimization. Uh, you have seven terabytes of data collected from Google, Bing, and Yahoo search engines. And you try to find out who is your nearest neighborhood on the internet for your domain, which is using exactly the same keywords as you and stealing your traffic. I will be happy to look into the SQL statement, which does that. That's frightening for every database. And we do it in less than a second on 10 billion records. And now, it's about you, and you have one minute to ask questions. Sorry? We use standard infrastructure, means uh, AMD, Opterans, Intel Neolim chipsets. Uh, they have a good memory throughput, and it, of course, it's an in-memory database, but it's not limited by the size of the memory. We just use the memory as basically a swap space uh, for all the indices and all the data which is persisted on the hard drive. So we just use it as a buffer, basically. And therefore, more uh, memory just allows you to keep more data in the system and access it faster, but it's all persisted. On the right. Sorry, can you? Oh, sure. Uh, we have multidimensional So partition. just to repeat that, can you remove historical data from the index? Yes, yes, you can. Uh, the whole system is, uh, is using a multidimensional index and you can drop partitions off, i.e. historical data, and index separately from the data, if you like. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> okay, so Vlad, make your way up here if you would. Uh, we're gonna wrap up. I thought this was the right topic to finish up the sessions tonight with the seven habits of successful NoSQL adoptions. Vladimir Bagvansky, take it away. Uh, your uh, your oh, quicker okay. is there. Okay. Great. So the background of this talk is uh, based on experiences that we have in introducing NoSQL. Now, what is interesting here is that we are not dealing with some uh, high-tech research projects, but we are trying to introduce NoSQL into ordinary organizations. Now, sometimes you are going to find that in such environment, people are very skeptical. You will have that the rest of the IT often feels a little bit threatened through the new technology and they think there might be shifts in organization. So uh, you have to deal with a number of software issues when you are introducing a NoSQL in the organization. And uh, here we are sharing a couple of our um, experiences. So 
we have uh, summarized the things that uh, we need to do in order to be successful in a set of habits. And we have a seven, seven habits. The first habit is, as you want to introduce a NoSQL in the organization, you have to actively look for the problems uh, where you can help with the introduction of NoSQL. Often you have technology groups in organizations, they are enamored by the new technology and they think that, that just by playing with it, they can introduce value to the enterprise. So you need to find the problems where you can truly ease the pain. Then, when you start working with your clients, make sure that you are truly delivering something tangible, something that will be very useful for the clients. Usually they need to spend some money to pay you. They are skeptical, it is new technology, it is different from the ordinary IT. And uh, in order to gain their confidence, you need to provide tangible value to them. Then you have to prioritize. You need to figure out what are the things that you can accomplish with the NoSQL, and uh, then choose the most useful thing for your clients first. And you need to work on it in order to prove the validity of your approach and the technology. One habit that we find is really important is, is really on the soft side. It is about stakeholdering doing stakeholder management, you need to cultivate relationship with your users. Often, they will be quite hesitant to give you a new project. And uh, in order to gain their confidence and maintain the trust, you need to constantly remind yourself that you need to work with them, inform them about the progress. You cannot just go away and spend a month or three months just playing with the new technology. So you need to be in constant touch with your users. Habit number six. Uh, one thing that we all often uh, see is that uh, looking into the new technology, we see that people are uh, getting uh, into depths of the mechanisms of particular NoSQL system, and uh, they get all bogged down into these details. However, one thing that they miss is the actual problem domain in which they need to apply the NoSQL. They often don't show enough interest in the problem area, and that then when they try to achieve something useful for the client, they don't have enough understanding of the problem domain. So that is something that uh, the NoSQL teams need to work from the beginning, explore the problem domain, the various um, domain modeling techniques that can be used, have a good communication with your stakeholders and users, and make sure that you are versed both in the NoSQL technology but also in the problem domain. Because often the problem domain that we are attacking is non-trivial and the technology alone would not help us to be successful in that space. Integrate with existing IT. The NoSQL solutions are not going to be isolated islands. They need to be integrated, not only in order to provide something useful to the client, but to be integrated into the whole ecosystem that you have in the company. So for that, you need to particularly pay attention is how are you going to get incorporated into the workflows that you have for the data movement. Uh, you need to integrate uh, by ingestion of plain files, uh, ingestion of uh, data from relational databases, and also your outputs should better match what is already existing in the infrastructure, as opposed to trying to create something revolutionary. So integration with existing IT, I would say, is one of the paramount things for the success, and also this is uh, one of the ways how you will gain the trust of the skeptics who are saying, we should be staying with relational databases. This new stuff is not going to be a match for our enterprise. So always integrate, even, even though that you will get a pushback occasionally. And finally, technologies are changing very quickly. So you always need to be the lookout for the new solutions. Uh, something that did not have a good technology support a year ago might be supported very well in the product that is now available. And then when you have these seven habits, repeat them every week. Every week in a meeting of your NoSQL team, make sure that you go through this checklist and uh, verify that you apply all of this. Thank you. Well, I think you could pretty much adapt this presentation for any new technology given, because uh, those are good internal consulting skills no matter what the purpose. So, um, first of all, thank you to all of our uh, instructors this evening. I uh, really appreciate having you involved and um, I hope it's left the rest of you with uh, at least a few useful ideas to follow up on over the next couple of days. We are reconvening at 8.30 tomorrow, and uh, I look forward to seeing all of you then, and have a good evening. Thanks, bye-bye.